first part in the game, I used to always try and get it. And if I had a one-on-one with a fullback, I'd just knock it and have a foot race and just see, you know, because if I was going to beat him, then it was like, this is going to be a good day. Mick McCarthy was amazing for me at that point. Um, he he reminded me that he first, when he first signed at Celtic, he actually got injured in pre-season and he missed the first sort of four or five months. So he says, well, I completely understand. I know what you're going through. You know, I, I felt I needed to stay in the Premier League and that's maybe the... The reasons that you mentioned and you know, and the goals that that's why Big Sam decided to, to sign me at West Ham. Just thinking, don't look nervous. Don't look nervous. You know the camera is going to be on you. It's your debut. Just sort of you know, take it in. Uh, and then Jack Wilkshire came off. I just like you know, high five, got on the pitch. And then I, ju- I just remember just going, you've done it. Like you, you've, you've paid for your country. No one can take this away from you. So how did your journey begin then? Were you in academy football and then obviously that transition to Gillingham, how did how did that come about? Yeah, well, I, I started like everyone else. I started as a kid, I played local football. Um, I, I, my brother was at a team, so I went and joined. I was too young. To, you know, I, I, when I first started, I was under sevens, but I was actually the year below. But I played up a year for that first year because I was just desperate to play and I was obviously there watching my brother all the time. So I just played, played in the games. And then I, I stayed local for a few years. Um, and then I um, I then got picked up um, by Millwall um, and I was there for about seven years. Um, and then about six, well, at 16, when you're getting offered a, like a YTS back then, um, I, got, I actually got released. Um, I got told not good enough. It, long story, sh- uh, short story long, <laughs> whatever way you would. I basically went into, um, after a game on a Saturday, I basically went into a, the the change room with my dad and there was like four coaches there and they yeah you know, they basically went no yes no no uh and then that was me i was done i was there for seven years and just got told not good enough um and you know if even though it's you know you're 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 16 i think that hit me really really hard um i went i came out the door and there was a gillingham scout there who was like look we've got a game tomorrow we'd love for you to come we really want you to get back in and i was I said no. I couldn't. I couldn't deal with it at the time. Um, I sort of went back in the car. Obviously, was upset. I was sat with my parents driving home, and I was like, I just, I don't want to. I don't want to do it. I, I just want to play with my mates locally. Don't want to do it. Um, luckily for me, the Gillingham scout kept on uh, calling me, um, and then about a couple of weeks later, I actually went on trial. Um, and believe it or not, I was useless on trial. My confidence had gone. Um, very difficult to, to sort. Of when you've been at a place for like seven years, so then all things change. You get told you're not good enough. I think mentally, I really struggled with that. Um, but luckily for me, I must have done something that they saw um, that that I'd uh, that I'd done. Uh, and they, after about five or six games I played, they then offered me uh, a YTS. And and for me, it, it, something in my mind just changed. And that was that was the that was the start of it. Do you think that was a Something that was needed within maybe your career to have the opportunities after Gillingham in terms of playing in the Premier League because you see a lot of examples in the Premier League where that happens. You know, players get released and then there's kind of this this momentum to try and prove a point. Was it something along those lines with you in terms of okay, I've got given this opportunity, let's try and do something with it? Yeah, I, th- I think so. I don't think it, like if uh, it's difficult to say exactly what it was. Um, me, I was, I was, I, I'd worked so hard, obviously like everyone, you work so hard to get to a point and then it's uh, based on someone's opinion and then you either get yes or yet no. And then to then get a yes, I just, I, I, I moved out at 16, I was in Dick, so it was literally, sole focus was them playing football. So that, that had a huge impact on me, um, uh, physically and mentally, um, to right, this is my opportunity, this is what I'm going for, um. And then you, you do have that bit in between your teeth because you're trying to prove a point to yourself more than anyone else. You know, right, I can do this. And for me, it was it's the turnaround. I think I got released at 16. I was playing in the championship at 17. Yeah, you know, it was that that quick. Um, so mentally, just getting that confidence boost of saying, yes, we want you and you, you're going to sign, played a huge part in my, my start and my career at, at Gillingham. And how was that in terms of obviously... If you get thrown into the deep end that Gillingham you mentioned then that you played in the championship early how was that for you in terms of that big transition amazing a massive wake up call um, I think 
you know, I had a lot of older pros that uh, were in the team at the time. Brilliant, really helped me um, sort of wake me up, I suppose, and looked after me in games. But when you're when you're playing in youth team football, when you're playing in the you know in the reserve team as it was back then, you know the result doesn't actually matter. It's everyone's just saying about the performance, you're improving, you're doing this. When you then get into the first team and you win or you lose or you draw. These are huge impacts in people's lives. You know, if we, if we, you know, players were coming in, if they didn't win or didn't get a draw, they didn't get a bonus, which means they then couldn't get their mortgage paid. You know, th- these were huge, um, huge moments in people's lives. And then you start realizing very quickly, you know, that if I didn't track that runner, it's, it's going to cost me because it's going to cost the team and it's going to cost me because I'm going to get in serious trouble with my teammates. And you, you wake up to the real world really quickly. Um, and it means a hell of a lot more because points are on the line and it's people's jobs. You know, if you're getting relegated or a promotion, it makes a huge, huge amount of difference to people's lives. So I think that that learning curve, you have to, you have to actually wake up really quickly. And I think that that no, I did. Um, and obviously, I thoroughly enjoyed it as well. They were The players around me were, were excellent. Um, obviously, training and getting into the first team, they, they, you know, they massively helped. Career. Just on that, was there a sense of motivation or pressure through that um, external, there's the external outcomes of a football club? You mentioned, obviously, if you don't track back, if you don't win, that there might be um, financial issues for the club if they don't stay in the league, etc. How did you cope with that as a player? I think uh, initially for me, you, you don't really, it doesn't really re- resonate with you that actually this is, you know, it's up to you. Because you're just playing, you're young, and you're just enjoying freedom of playing football. Uh, it's only a, like probably a couple of years later that you s- start realising, well, actually, yeah, it does affect everyone, and it does, and then that pressure comes along. But you can only do. I, I got told very early, you can only control the controllables. You know, everything external, you can't. You can't feel like that's nothing to do with you. You can't control that. You can only control exactly what you can do. And that was me with day in, day out, and training, and then that was me on a match day. So I tried tried it's pretty, sometimes it's very difficult but try to to focus just on my own game and obviously help the my teammates around me what was the best piece of advice you got entering first team football uh, Is there anything else uh, a and really difficult one to uh, later on in my career was uh mickey bray used to say run fast score goals nice and simple that was it <laughs> run fast score goals uh, the most, uh best piece of advice i think that there's so many different pieces that you have to, you can't just take one uh, you know, football's based on opinions, so you, you've got to take everyone's opinion but with a pinch of salt. You know, you, you can take bits of some, bits of another, but ultimately, after a game, you know whether you play well or if you haven't. So I was my biggest critic all the time. So I found it if I came off the pitch, I know whether I played well or if I didn't. And you take the bits that you did well, and you, you know, I used to watch back over games that I didn't do so well, so that you can see. Actually, yeah, I, I can see now why either the players or the manager or, or whoever would say that because you can then go, actually, no, you're right. Because it's actually, I I didn't like looking over it. I don't think anyone does when you look at the bad bits. But actually, until you actually see it with your own eyes on the screen, you don't really think that you're doing it. And I think that's something that, uh, that I, I found out and used, um, especially more later on in my career. So to be a bit more self-reflective and analyse from a different perspective. Yeah, I think you, definitely that's that's something that I did. I, I was very much just self-analysing everything. But you, advice-wise, it's you just go out and enjoy yourself. But you've got to, you, yeah, you've got to be dedicated. You've got to put in the work. But try and enjoy the moment of, of well as as a, a play football. You know, it's the best. You know, in brackets job in the world you know you, you you're playing something that's your, your hobby it's your best thing you could possibly do go out and enjoy it yes there's so many other sides of it but you've got to enjoy the moment that you're actually on the pitch and play it so, so talk to me about the transition from Gillingham to Wolves and obviously being from the kind of the south region relocating uh I suppose that kind of had a big impact on you and your career and adjusting to to the West Midlands and obviously your new football club and a new environment yeah, I mean, it's it was a huge, um, huge change for me. I, as I mentioned, I I did move into Diggs at sixteen, so the actual not living at home was wasn't an, an issue. Um, obviously, yeah. it's a bit further, so it's that whole whole you know not being able to just nip home uh, whenever whenever you wanted. Um, but uh, at that point in my career, I was 
ready to move on. Um, I I felt like I needed to. So I think we Gillingham we were in League One at the time. I got I was in Team of the Year. I'd done really well in the Championship as well, and and I, I needed to to need to go and get back as high as, as possible. Which I had a few clubs interested, but I went and met Nick McCarthy. And obviously after meeting him, there was only one place I was going to going to go, and that was Wolves. Um, so t- to then move up. Um, at the time, I'd been with my now wife uh, just under a year, uh, and she just finished uni, just finished her degree, and it was one of them things that just you know everything aligns. And it was like, well, I'm moving up to the Midlands. Um, obviously, I would love you to come with me, but I understand it's you know so it's quite new, it was a big change. Um, but we did, we we moved up. So for me, it was it, it was great to to actually have her with me to actually have that sort of support I suppose as well as someone to lean on and to to actually have that journey and transition with um, and the same for her I think because moving moving out of home moving away and going into work up there as well um, it sort of helps the transition but as far as going to the club I didn't know anyone at the club if I'm honest as in like personally obviously I knew all the players but not not personally so it was that whole proving yourself again um you know, when you go to any club, you want to show what you can do. But actually, not personally knowing any of the players, it makes it more apparent that you've got to go and do what you can do. Because even the fans, you know, I'm coming from a lower league side that the rest of the players have either, you know, played in the league or, or, or you know, they, they've been there and done it. So it's it's uh, it's more pressure, but it's more stuff that you, for me personally, you, I thrive. I wanted to go and enjoy myself. I wanted to go and prove to people that I was ready, to, and that was my stage. Obviously, it didn't start particularly well. I got injured in pre-season, um, which is a horrendous thing to do when you go to a new team. But Mick McCarthy was amazing for me at that point. Um, he he reminded me that he first when he first signed at Celtic, he actually got injured in pre-season and he missed the first sort of four five months. Uh, so he says, well, "I completely understand. I know what you're going through." You know, make sure you're right before you come back. It makes it all. I know you want to come back. I know what you do. Rush. I know when you do this. So it sort of helped me massively. To obviously, I was still desperate to get back, but actually to be right and to to get back and and uh, show everyone what it was about. And that's exactly what I did. What was it about Mick McCarthy then? So obviously, you mentioned him, mentioned it twice in terms of obviously that initial first conversation and whilst you, you were injured. What was it about his leadership that you could relate to? Is there anything that stands out in terms of your time at war? Yeah, the biggest thing I can say about Mick, I'd say he's the best manager I've worked under for, you know, I've been for a long period of time, um, is he's honest. I think that's his biggest biggest gift that he, he has is he's honest. He works with me every day. He's on the training field. He's, he's there. He tells you exactly what's going on. You know, whether you played well, whether you didn't, why you didn't, why you did. If you're in the team, if you're out the team, you know, he, he was just honest. And as a player, that's all you really want. You know, you don't want someone to say, oh, look, you're doing really well, but I'm just going to leave you out in this game and you're playing the next one. And then the team wins because, oh, well, why, why am I not playing in the next game? Oh, well, the team won and we can't change this and do that. Well, why did you change it in the first place? Just be honest. I think that's, as players, that's all you want. So... He, he was very much like that. Don't get wrong, all of the other stuff, the training ground, he had great people around him. That's another thing that he did really well. You know, he had Terry Connor, uh, TC, who was a fantastic coach. I had Tony Daly as my fitness coach, who was, you know, for, for me, I played in that, his well, his position, I suppose. I was the same as him in the sense that I was a right-footed player on the left-hand side. He was quick. You know, he liked to cut inside and shoot. That was my sort of game. So he, I was able to learn a lot as well. So, Mick just had the honesty, he had the dedication and being on the training pitch, but had people around him as well, which which hugely affected and helped my game. What what was it like in terms of relationships at Anami Tree? Because obviously, if you look at the Premier League now, you know, is, is it a close relationship or is it kind of a, in a relationship where you know that you need to maybe have stand? Obviously, the stands are set high by Mick, but. You know, was it close? Would he put his arm around you? Would he be quite raw with you? I'm just intrigued on how he was with the group as a, as, a, as a whole. Yeah, I think you know he still had that aura when he came into the like, You know, like stop, don't say anything. Uh, he still had that about him. But yeah, you know, as a group, obviously he had that attention as soon as he walked in. You know, he you would listen to him. He had that authority. Um, would he put an arm around you? I think he would. 
maybe not put an arm around you as such. <laughs> you know, we'd pull you in the office, you'd ch- chat to you, make sure everything was was all right and explain the reasons whether you were paying or whether you weren't. Um, I think it's very different nowadays. The game has changed a lot with regards to how people, you know, now you, or even back then, when, you know, certain players needed certain things, certain players have to be spoken to in different ways. I think Sam Allardyce as well was very much like that. Um, you know, you, not everyone can be spoken to or dealt with in the same way. Um, and I think that's that's the sign of a, of a good manager to be able to see and use different ways of either, you know, uh, telling people they aren't having a good game or speaking to someone a uh, different way. And I think some people need, you know, a rocket sometimes and other people don't. And I think that was... Uh, one one part of, of the way that um, that Mick and, and I suppose Sam um, also also did. So obviously you get fit and Wolves win the uh, championship in two thousand and nine. Um, can you explain what that season was like and why do you think you were so successful yeah. in um, that group of players? Obviously you mentioned Mick McCarthy, but was there any standout justifications and why that was a successful time for you? Absolutely, yeah. Um, the season before, we finished seventh and missed out on the playoffs by one goal. Uh, but that team was just building. Uh, we had a lot of young players that never played together, never really played in the championship. They missed out on the. Uh, they missed out in the playoffs the season before I signed. So it, everyone had a bit of that grit in between their teeth that you know we'd never we'd never played at the the top level. I suppose we all were hungry to to get there and. We signed a few role players in the summer and pre-season. There was just that feel. I, I it's it's really hard to put on like pinpoint what it is, but you you ask any player in pre-season whether you're winning and losing, or you go into a season, it's a bit of the unknown. But we we had a feeling in the, that pre-season camp that we had a really good squad, really good squad, and we start the season really well. Um, obviously. A lot of us were similar age. Um, you know, we'd never played in the Premier League. There was a few older pros that were very good with us. Um, and we, we all got on really well. I think that was a huge positive for us as a team spirit and morale. And, you know, we would go out as a team. We would go out with wives and girlfriends together as well. I think that it made it made us like a real strong unit. And I, I remember a game, I think it was Forest at home. Um, I think we were 4 new up at half time. I think it was 4 new. Um, and we blew them away in the first half. And you, after that game, I think we finished five one, and we were just like, "Yeah, like we can we can do something special here." And that was like the biggest turning point that we were like, "Yeah, we're actually gonna do something." And then from then on in, it was it was fantastic. It was an incredible season. Um, absolutely, it really 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 good group of lads all working hard each other. And you know, we had some brilliant moments as a team. Um, and whenever we needed something, we, we had that mentality. Even if we were one little down, we were like, it's fine. We're going to score. We're going to score. Um, and that, that was a that was a huge, huge positive in, in our team. Just on that then, so obviously the Championship, 46 games, you mentioned the different types of emotions that happen. You're winning 4-0 or you're probably losing 1-0, but there's that confidence to, to obviously succeed and win the games. How do you... How do you keep kind of calm during those situations? How do you keep level-headed? And obviously, you mentioned the manager. I'm, I'm sure he uh, processed that within, you know, his team talks or pre pre talks to ensure that you know there's a consistency and there's a an attitude to to keep pushing and working hard. I'm just intrigued on that. Yeah. Well, I, what I didn't mention is after towards the end of the season, we went through a spell where we actually win in 13. Yeah, I think it was 13. So yeah, that that's where you start going. Oh, hold on a minute. We're we're um, you know, we are we letting it slip? But for us, we were I say fortunate, but every time we lost, for instance, the team below us, which I think was Reading at the time, I think I could be wrong with that, uh, they lost. So it was it was just mad how things happened. Because if we lost and somebody had won, then you get a bit more pressure, you get more anxiety. But it was just if we lost, they lost. And then if we won, they won. And we were still keeping that gap all the way along. Um so Trying to just go game by game is is the old cliche, but I think Mick was very. He worked us hard on the training pitch, drilled us, and and worked us to make sure that each game we were ready for to doing something for that that game. It wasn't all the same. Uh, it was it, it was working towards the whatever team we were playing. Uh, we 
we we we, um, we had a lot. We had a really good squad of players, so there was a few tweaks in in there as well. And obviously injuries and that that all that all comes down to you know players at the time. But the mentality of us was we were so desperate to to all play in the in the top division, which we never had. Just so to try and try and actually reach that goal was just keep grinding away, get that result. And I think Derby away was a huge huge result where. I think Andy Keogh scored the first. I think I scored the second. And then uh, I think Andy scored the third. I can't quite remember. But that game was like, that was the biggest turning point towards the end of the season where we got ourselves back in front and was like, yeah, that's that's a huge step forward to, to, to winning the championship. Was there any, yeah, obviously, you mentioned a few players in, Andy Keogh, etc. Was there any standout players in terms of that season that... that uh... Kind of enabled you to to really have that confidence to go on and win. Obviously, there are any Banks Blake up front, Cole Henry, a few other players. Was there anyone that stood out during that during that time? Obviously, I think everyone stood out in in their own right. We had our strikers. We had Sylvan and Chris Uelamo. Start of season, them two were were just on fire. I think they both had like 13, 14 goals by Christmas or something like that. Like 12, 13 goals each. Yeah, so. Our strike course was incredible, but then, you know, we if if one of them wasn't playing well or if they didn't start, you had Andy Kier, you had Sam Vokes. You know, we had low, they, were, they scored so many important goals for us. So we always felt like we would score. Um, and then we had myself and Kites on each wing, which was like, get it wide, get crossed in the box, get shots off. And as you said, you know, Dave Edwards in the middle with Carl Henry, David Jones. The rotation in that was, you know, depending on, if we we like to play four four two in the championship because we wanted two strikers, two wingers, two midfielders. But if if at any point that changed, we had Carl Henry and David and Jones with Dave Edwards in front, and it the squad. This is what I mean. If anyone wasn't playing particularly well or was injured, someone else would come in, and obviously the defence as well. It's all about a team. Um, but our, our our sort of way of thinking was we would score more than anyone else. I think, and that's that's how we. That's why we approached games, I think. So obviously that transition to the Premier League, you're destined to, to play, the team's hungry. How did you find the Premier League? How did you adjust to it? Obviously, being the pinnacle of football in in the in Europe and across the world. Yeah. Did you cope? How did you cope with that, Matt? So to me, I, I actually, I loved it. I thrived a bit. I think the, the thing for me is I felt, in some ways it's really, it's hard to describe, but in the championship, as a wide player, this is for me, as a, a as a wide player, you get less time on the ball, but it's easier to do something with in the championship. Which what I mean by that is when you receive the ball, someone's straight on you, kicking you up in the air, whatever. But if you get turned, you could probably get around them or look it past them or put a cross in or a shot in a little bit easier. Whereas in the Prem, you sort of got a bit more, I don't know, um, uh, more respect in, in some ways because you get the ball, you could actually turn but then to take someone on or to put that shot or pass or cross in, they were then there, they would block you. And then you try to run a little quicker and stronger and hold you off. And so you had to, I had to sort of adapt and think of how I would best get in the game or how I would influence the game. We also changed formation. Uh, we didn't go full 4 2. We were a sort of a 4 5 1, 4 3 3, whatever way you want to look at it. So my role in the team slightly changed in the sense that I, I was always. The attacking threat, I had to, you know, pick the ball up and run length of the pitch, or I had to be if someone was crossing a run, I had to be the other striker getting caught because we only had the one. So I had to make up the number. So I absolutely loved it because for me, my fitness levels were great. I was quick. So the fullbacks were obviously always everyone's always worried about pace uh, behind them. So I used to first sort of First part in the game, I used to always try and get it. And if I had a one-on-one with a fullback, I'd just knock it and have a foot race and just see, you know, because if I was going to beat him, then it was like, this is going to be a good day. If, it, if I didn't, then you're like, right, okay, I'm going to have to either next one, maybe I'll cut inside and have a cross or do I pretend to go down? So you start thinking a bit more. Um, but I loved it. I thrived. Yeah, I, I felt like I, I took on every single fullback that, that I come up against. And these were the best players in the world. What do you think that is then, Matt, in terms of the difference between the Championship and Premier League? Is it more strategic? Is it more technical? Is it less physical? I'm just intrigued on what, why that is a difference there. Yeah, 
I think obviously in the Premier League, if you give the opposition team a charge, they take it. Whereas I think in the Championship, if you give them a charge, you you could get punished, but you might not. I think that's the that's the biggest thing. It's it's them fine margins. Where if you get a one on one and you miss, you might not get another one on one. You know, it's just taking that opportunity. I think it's difficult. It's difficult to say whether it's less physical. I think. I think maybe you won't be hustling and bustling as much in the Premier League, potentially, but you'll just probably actually run further or let... It's, it all depends on games. So if you're playing against Man City, you're probably not going to run as much as you would against a team that maybe you dominate possession more because you're camped in your own half against Man City because you are you can't get out because they've got the ball all the time, so you're shuffling over defending and camped in your own half. Whereas if you're playing a team that you know, you've got an opportunity to win the game, you're going to be sprinted up. You've got to then sprint back. You're sprinted up. You're getting back. Whereas, so there's, there's, it, it's very different in each game. I think the championship's a bit more end to end. Back then it was anyway, a bit more end to end. Whereas the Premier League, I think you get a bit more. Um, one team will have possession, and then the other team. It's not as it's not as end to end as as the championship. You said then that um, you always used to try and take on the right back or the left back, depending on where you were playing um, within midfield. Is there anyone that stands out in terms of the, the most challenging defender that you've come across? This, honestly, there's, there's so many. I've played a bit against the best players in, in, the, in the world at that point. You know, I'd say Ashley Cole's probably the best fullback that's ever played in the Premier League for me. Um, obviously, he was at Chelsea at the time and they were dominating possession and he was like a winger. And then if you got an opportunity, he was quick and able to get back and was a good defender. So he was difficult. Um, obviously, I had like Ivanovic, and then it was like uh, Zabaleta when he first came to City. Um, but like, even, um, like Phil Bardsley was was a difficult one for me as well. I think he was very physical, liked to get close and tackle you, but obviously still liked to get forward. But it's so difficult. Yeah, I played against Kyle Walker loads as well um, at Spurs. Um, but for me, I, I never thought, thought, oh God, I can't. Can't play against this boy. I, I loved it. I thought, well, this is my opportunity to go and just try and do something and play against someone. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I, I can never look back and say, oh, I didn't really try against that player. I did. Every single opportunity I got, I tried to take someone on. So just on that then, is it? am I right in saying that you had the record for the most crosses in Europe at one point? Am I right in saying that? You you are correct in saying that it was the last, my last year at Wolves. I put the most crosses in in Europe and most successful cross, crosses in in Europe. And then my first season at West Ham, I did the same. So the, for two seasons, I tried most crosses in Europe and most successful. So yeah, I like to say I backed it up. <laughs> Do you think that got you your transfer to stay in the Premier League? Then obviously with Wolves, um, kind of in in an element of relegation and obviously going to West Ham. Do you think that was kind of a, a pinnacle you, you really selling point to get you to West Ham? <laughs> I think, obviously, I just um, I got the England side of Wolves in that season, uh, which was, you know, it's the pinnacle for me. Um, I was playing at Wolves. We were we were fighting relegation. Um, the rest of the, like, wingers, I suppose, they were in the squad. They're all top four, top five teams, you know, um, played, you know, at the, at the best of their career. So, for me to get in and play in and, and within that crop of players was was amazing. Um, but that was that was the ultimate reason why I I did leave Wolves and, and went to West Ham is I wanted to I showed that I felt like I was deserved to play in the Premier League. I scored I think the last thirteen games of the season, I scored seven goals. Um so you know, I was in really good goal scoring form. I was playing really well, uh, even though we, we unfortunately got relegated. So uh, I uh you know, I, I felt I needed to stay in the Premier League and that's maybe the, the reasons that you mentioned and you know, and the goals that that's why Big Sam decided to, to sign me at West Ham. Is there an element of wanting to kind of come back close to your family as well, Matt? Obviously, you mentioned growing up in that in the area, Gillingham the Wall and obviously West Ham are very close in terms of location. Well, obviously, you grew up there. Yeah. Is that something that kept... that, that Sorry, was that something that was in, in mind during that transition? Yeah. To be honest, not really. Um, you know, I, you mentioned about Gillingham. Well, I was actually I grew up, I grew up in Guildford, so it wasn't close to, to Ebra, really. So I was south, um, but uh, no. To be honest, I, I always looked at it that um, I, um, I, you know, football, you know, was 
are going to be an amazing period of my life, but you got to whatever opportunity came up, I would have gone if it was up north, if it was wherever, I feel like I would have I would have gone where I thought would have been the best possible place for me. Um so that was that was at the time that was that was the my best option. So I you know, don't get me wrong, once you make that decision then you think, Oh, I could I could move back home and travel in and do all that that they all things then come into your mind. But at the time I it wasn't that wasn't one of the reasons for me to sign at West Elbert. You mentioned England, um, obviously representing England. I think it was Ghana that you, you come on in terms of your, your debut. Um, how was that process for you? And obviously uh, being introduced to the squad where there's established internationals there that have been selected for a significant amount of years. How, how was that in terms of trying to impress and feeling involved and getting involved yeah. in, in, in the setup? Crazy, really. It's like that first day back at school. Um, really. You're going in, obviously, paid against all of them, but not really knowing them personally. You know, if there's a lot of players there, they're all at the same club. They've been in the squads for ages. Uh, and as you say, like all established playing players like Rooney, Terry, Lampard, you know, it's quite a quite an m- amazing squad of players. So, but <clears throat> it's just the initial getting that, that first through the door. Hello was the manager. I used one of the first people I saw as I walked through the door. Um, obviously, didn't speak loads of English, but um, you know, it was just like, oh, are you pleased to be here? I was like, obviously, it is because <laughs> I, I scored on the weekend. I scored for Wolves against Aston Villa away, and he was like, that goal sort of got you in. And I was like, wow. He said you were close, but that goal got you in. So, oh, that was you know, I suppose nice to hear. Um, but then once you're in the training field, you actually, in some ways, that's your comfort blanket, and that's like you're what you do day in day out, but. You start thinking, oh, if I go in the middle of the, on a keep ball session, I could be in there all bad. <laughs> yeah, pretty busy. I'm trying to close up on that, but um, it it was brilliant, and the lads were great. And obviously, the downtime was was good to be able to get to know a few more people. And they all played table tennis, and I played a little bit <clears throat> to start with, and and then I got I got beaten quite a few times. And then once I'd had a little practice, I then went and beat everyone. And then the next day, someone found out about my mum and dad. And, <laughs> Which is very fun. amazing experience. Obviously, like I mentioned before, it's the pinnacle. Play for your country. Uh, luckily for me, it was at it was at Wembley in front of all of my friends, all of my family. Um, I was, you know, I was very lucky to to be able to to have everyone there that that I could possibly want. And uh, you know, there's so many Jills, Wolves, West Ham fans that were there that remember it. Um, so amazing experience. Um, yeah, you know, and it's it like I said, it's the pinnacle. It's it's, the, it's it's what you dream of as a kid. What was the mindset shift then going into to, to England? Is this sense of imposter syndrome, as you kind of mentioned, in terms of the rondos of being in the middle? But just intrigued on on how you you have that self belief and confidence to go. Okay, I actually deserve to represent my country. I actually deserve to be playing with these world class players. Um, what's the mindset? Yeah, there is, there is that. Yeah, there, there is that you've got to try and think that because that's how you got there. Um, the morning of the game, actually, um, John John Terry actually messaged me and said the exact thing. You know, which was yeah, he didn't need to. That was a really nice thing to that he was captured at the time. Uh, just saying, like, go out and enjoy. It. You deserve to be here. Go and show why you deserve to be here. And, you know that that sort of thing. And it was, it's just a, them little reminders, and you think actually, yeah, I you know I've worked hard my whole life to get to this point you know this is why you know you deserve to be here and then you start as i mentioned once you get into the trailing side of things you sort of not at home but you're that's where you, your belief and that's where your repetitions over the years of everything that you've done you just sort of get into that zone but I'll, i can i can still vividly remember warming up after half time you know running up and down and then getting that look back and someone sort of waving you back and sort of looking at me and I, yeah, and I was I sprinted back, uh, sort of everything ready, and then um, you know doing the tactics, and then I just remember standing at the side of the pitch and just thinking, "Don't look nervous, don't look nervous." You know the camera is going to be on you. Yeah, it's your debut. Just sort of you know, take it in, uh, and then Jack Wilkshire came off. I just like you know, high five, got on the pitch, and then I just, I just remember just going, "You've done it." Like you, you've you've paid for your country, no one can take this away from you. Yeah, you, you've achieved it. And then once you've all said in play, 
it sounds so rubbish, but it is like you're back into playing the game, playing the match. And I got quite a few early touches, which helped massively. Uh, you have a touch, give it, keep the ball, give it. And then I had a couple of runs, you know, a couple of crosses, a couple of corners. And you're then just into it. Uh, the nerves obviously still there. It's, it's, it, it's the best feeling in the world, but you, you're trying to then get back to why you were in that team and why you were playing because that's what you've done on a regular basis for, for the top walks. How did you um, deal with Capello? Obviously, you mentioned throughout the podcast Allardyce and Carthy and, and very traditional English coaches. And you mentioned Capello's English wasn't great. How did you deal with that in terms of him being from Italy and obviously being involved in the kind of the the, the, the group in that sense? Yeah, uh, honestly, it was it was fine. I think the players sort of helped me as well because they'd obviously been with him for a long period of time. Um, you know, he had his things that everyone had to be there to go into dinner. Everyone had to be finished before he'd leave, uh, which I, all stuff that I actually found like, yeah, that's understandable. Uh, it, it, yeah, I understand why he's done that. Um, but it was it was the group of players that helped as well. Like the training wise, they obviously had already done the stuff before previously. What he would have done with like keep balls and the shooting and the patterns of play. Um, so you just sort of. You just you just get over it. It's, it's stuff that you would know anyway. You've probably done it in training with another coach, but it's just trying to get the language barrier and understand exactly what he wants from the team. But the players help as well. Uh, uh, so for me, it was it was absolutely fine. Um, it's more like the when you know the tactics for the actual game and what what's he want, and then you're on the clipboard and showing what if I'm a player, what does he want from me? You know, am I, or am I just going to go and do what? what's got me in the team, you know, that that sort of thing. So I, I I found it fine and I had that utmost respect for him. I was I was actually delighted that someone of his calibre has actually picked me for my debut for England because, you know, he you know, he didn't have to. He could have picked anyone that was playing in the top six, but he picked me because I was playing well at the time. So that was a that was a huge confidence booster in its own for me. So going back to club football then, we mentioned obviously the transition from Wolves to West Ham. How did you find that in terms of going into a new group and obviously a stab yeah. at Premier League club? I think I think at the time actually West Ham were kind of flirting with the bottom. So obviously was it the same conditions in terms of Wolves and, and kind of trying to stay in the league? And No, so, yeah, so Wolves, unfortunately, we went down and then yeah. actually went up through the playoffs. So... They were sort of back to the unknown of the Premier League. Um, yeah. So that was, it was, for me, it was really quite easy to, to go into the team in the sense of the players that were there. Um, you know, that you had likes of like James Collins, Mark Noble, Jack Collison, Tompkins. You had so many players that had been there for a while um, and knew the club. And for me to actually go into it, it was, you know, I, you know, you, you, all, you all have your roles. My role was obviously get the ball wide, put the ball in the box, Andy Carroll, and just come on loan. It was like, I remember Sam, once I'd signed, I went to the training ground because they don't show you the training ground before you sign because it was all port cabins. Right. <laughs> so you, I, I arrived and he was in a meeting. So he'd come out of the meeting and I was at the port cabin door. And as he came come out, he had to like duck to get through the thing. And like, it's the first time I've sort of been up close to him. And I was like, that. I was like, wow. He messed it and he was like, Is it done? I was like, Yep, all done. He was like, Fantastic. And then sort of went back it and was like, I, And then the next day he was like, Oh, I've, I've, I've got someone coming that's going to be brilliant for you. And Andy Carroll's side, he played with the most headers in the in the league or in Europe. And then we crossed his side, was like, This is going to be perfect. Um, which, which was a, a great start for me. And, and did that benefit you in terms of having those big strikers up top and obviously playing wide? Did that did that help with numbers and assists, etc.? Yeah, I think the, the unfortunate thing for, for for us as a team is Andy obviously was he struggled with injury a, a fair bit, um, but yes, it did. I think the way Sam plays and the way tactically and the way he drills you is you actually all know what you're supposed to be doing in that team, so. Obviously, you have to, I had to learn other bits to the bit where he wanted me in like set pieces and the build up into certain positions. But ultimately, he wants me to get wide, get all in the box. And he had three areas where he, where he wants me to put it, you know, near post, penalty spot or hang it up at the back. And he called it the pomo. <laughs> so that, that was the three positions. So for me, 
sometimes if you just aim for an area, he would be on the players to get into these three areas. So sometimes if you if you didn't have a chance to put your head up and have a look, if you hit one of these areas, if someone wasn't there, he would go nuts. It was just about every time I got a ball, players knew where I was going to go, whether I was going to cut in on my right or if I was going to knock it down the line. If I went down the line, they knew it was the majority was either going to be cut back or hung to the back post. If I was coming in on my right, it was going to be whipped in. And if, ever, if everyone missed it, it was going in at the far post. That was sort of like drilling it so that everyone knew exactly what was going on. Uh, and that, that was good. And obviously, you know, sometimes it's a bit more predictable, but it was... It, for me, it, made, it really broke everything down to like the finer details and made it simple simple for people to be like, right, this is what's going to happen. Make sure you're there. So for me, it, it, it was fine. What was your relationship like with the, the fans then? Matt at uh, Upton Park, I think. Am I right in saying, is it the chicken run down the one side of the the ground at the aunt? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you play another wing. I, I suppose you you <laughs> you seen it and heard it all. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I played there the year before as a, an away player when I was at Wolves, and um, and Wolves actually we won three one, and I actually scored. So I did everything, good and bad. Um, and then obviously then playing there for the home team, obviously the fans were were electric. You know, I was on the wing, uh, I was right next to them in Upton Park. You were so close. If I was taking a corner, I'm literally in the crowd. So. It was, it was an amazing atmosphere that the fans were extremely passionate and very vocal and you know it was it was it was great to to show and to show your commitment as a player and it, all they want is is pride and passion and, and desire and if you did all that they you know, they they liked it uh, did you come within injuries towards the latter end of well, um uh, sorry injuries in terms of latter end of uh, West Ham obviously going out alone at Norwich and trying to maybe re reinstall that form and that consistency as, as you've kind of alluded to Frey how, how did you cope with with maybe injuries and setbacks and trying to rebuild that is the 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 what the, the downside of, of a professional sport um injuries um obviously when I was at Wolves towards the end Sam sort of played a different system no wide players played like a diamond so I didn't play as much that season um and then Sam and Bilic came in and I played the first five games of the Premier League on the, I came on uh, as a substitute, but because I, I hadn't played much the year before, I was desperate to just go and play football. Um, he he was happy with me staying. Uh, obviously, I played, but he, could, he said, I couldn't guarantee you're going to play every week. But as you can see, you've been involved in the games. And I got an opportunity to go to Norwich and it was only on loan. Um, and I, I just felt for me personally, I needed to go and play some football. I couldn't, I couldn't sit on the bench again all season. I, I found it very difficult mentally to to trade a week and not play on a Saturday. Uh, I, I just I, I just wanted to play football, so I I went on loads to Norwich, which started like a house on fire. It was brilliant. I sc- scored in my day. We scored in my second game. After about the first ten games, I think we were we were playing really well, um, and yeah, unfortunately, I uh, I decided to do my first proper tackle, and it was on the Ali Tory and he broke my leg. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, that's where it all sort of started for me. And it, if if I if I actually could sort of stop time and say see what was actually going to happen for the next sort of three years, I think I, I don't know how I would have got through it. I think if you if you're able to just go from day to day, I think it's easier in the mind. I unfortunately I did my knee. I didn't have an operation. Got myself back playing after about three months. I think it was about ten weeks. And I played the rest of the season, but my knee was never right. Um, I was in pain. We unfortunately got relegated. Um, and then I had to have an operation in the pre-season, uh, which I was out for then three months again. Which, when you have an operation, especially on your knee, you you lose all of the muscles around it. So all my quad just disappeared, calves disappeared because you can't weight bear and do all this. So it's the... You build, have to build all your muscles up again in the gym, which is like, it's a bit monotonous. You know, every day you're in the gym doing the same drills. You're looking out onto the pitch where everyone's training. Uh, you can't do it. You're then doing all your fitness stuff. You're doing all this. So it's it's really quite hard to just each day go in, same thing, make sure you're doing your straight, do this, do that, while watching everyone else play. You obviously go and support the lads on a Saturday. Uh, but then I got in, I 
just about my first training session back from a knee, I, I got tackled on my ankle and I really hurt my ankle. But because I'd just been out, I was like, oh, I'll get through it. I had injections after injections after injections. Uh, and I couldn't, I just couldn't get, couldn't get back. My ankle was really sore. So I had to have another operation. And what they found was uh, on my, on my back of my ankle. So if you imagine in, on a, on a scan, that's, that's your cartilage. Mine was just inflamed and red, but it was like that. They said when they went into the operation, when they touched the top layer of the cartilage, it all fell off. So it was just flat. So on the scan, it has not just gone back. But when I was running, it would fall off. So that's why I had all the pain because there was two bone on bone. Um, so I had the operation, uh, which took a really long time. Um, I remember waking up and going, oh, was it all all right? And they were like, oh, it's a lot worse than we thought. You know, I, I was thinking I was going to be back playing in about six to eight weeks, but it was nearly like 11, 10 months, um, which was extremely, extremely difficult period of my life, let alone career. Um, at that point, I just had my son, my firstborn. Uh, my wife and I were made a conscious decision that for us as a family, she would move back home with support around her and I could focus on trying to get fit, uh, which was our own decision. But it meant I sort of missed six days a week, really. Uh, my son and my family, um, and then they would travel up and I would travel back as opt- often as I could. But at that point, when you're injured, you're in six days a week. You're making sure that you're on point with everything. Uh, and I, I was so solely focused on trying to get fit, but it was it was really difficult. I was in pain every day. I couldn't walk without pain. I, I saw the specialists umpteen times. They basically told me to retire I said no uh I then battled back got myself sort of back fit and then picked up uh, another injury which is called IT band friction syndrome that if you've ever heard of it it's where basically like having a dagger in the side of your leg every time you run um so that wasn't pleasant so I had another operation so that was four operations in three years um really really difficult to mentally and physically to get over um, but I stayed in it and got myself through. I even got offered, um, like Norwich basically said they'll pay me up a year's money because I obviously hadn't played. And I, I turned it down. I was like, no, yeah, I want to, I want to get back fit. I want to play. Um, so I finally got myself back fit um, and was was feeling good. But at this point, you know, Norwich were top of the league and flying in the championship. Um, so I got on really well with Daniel Farker. Um, who was the manager at the time. <clears throat> and he just um, basically said that he would love to keep me, wants to keep me, but I couldn't guarantee playing because they were doing so well. So I had the opportunity to go on loan, which I uh, which I did. And it was the, it was the best thing for me. It, uh... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. It was, it was the best thing for me because I, all I wanted to do was just play football. Um, I'd worked so hard to get myself back fit. And uh, I remember that first game I played, I went on the to Walsall and we played in the cup against Bolton away. And I think I trained on like the Friday or something and then we, we went and played. And I just remember that feeling of walking out down the tunnel, lining up. That was just incredible. And then obviously kick off about 10 minutes in, I've got my first assist. Um, and it was just like electric for me to be back out on the pitch doing what I love. Uh, after everything that possibly happened, um, to then finish the game with two assists, even though we lost two assists, I was like, it was just amazing to to be back playing, and that was what it was all for, um, really, for to get myself back and, and enjoy playing football again. Just on that, in terms of the the mental the mental factors that occur during that transition of not playing and then getting injured, um, and then. I'm looking at opportunities and where you're going to fit in and seeing teammates do well. You mentioned Norwich doing successfully well and you not playing a part as much as you should. And then, obviously, your time at Warsaw and coming towards the end of your career. How would you cope with retirement then, Matt? Is there anything that kind of springs to mind in terms of how you cope with coming towards the end of your career? And is there anyone that you work with to kind of mentally prepare for that? I'm just intrigued on that in terms of what you mentioned. Yeah. You you never cope when you come into retirement. You um, 
you never think you're going to retire. That's the thing. Uh, you always think you're just going to keep playing. Um, unfortunately for me, my my sort of body in the end basically told me, um, and I think that's how everyone sort of decides. But I I'd, I'd been <clears throat> I've been um, having you know we had um, people in at, at walls um, you know that you would go and do some uh, as a team you do like a you know chatting away and different um, psychologists would, would be in we had a guy called Bill there and then we moved when I went to West Ham there was another when we first signed you had to do this test that you'll find out whether you're red yellow blue or whatever which was red was like fiery so it's depending on how you were were dealt you to deal with um and then obviously when i was at norwich yes i had a had a, a guy there called uh, gavin who uh, i spoke to regularly um and it was it's something that i was never against i think yeah my, my wife's very much on the uh her and her mum are very similar I had like psychotherapists uh, they like to talk about everything and everything everything out there whereas i'm a bit more like mm, not really up for that but that side of things has really opened me up my obviously being with my wife there a long long time um that's helped me as well being able to talk and open up about a lot of things uh but yeah i think it's very difficult to to talk and to think about the 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 retirement side of things um lucky i remember as a kid getting told at 17 you've got to start thinking about what you're going to do when you retire and you're like i'm 17 about ages but it, it goes like that and you do have to start and i think that for me if i if i if i stopped planned or not sort of financially done this and done that i think i could understand why a lot of players find it extremely difficult when they retire because you 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 know your money stops for one i think the transition from being told what to do where to be what to bring for 20 years i think that that is another massive factor. I think that's it. Sounds stupid, and it's like, oh my, oh yeah, and get the violin out. But actually, if you've been drilled for twenty years, what to do, where to be, what to breathe, you end up having to start making decisions for yourself. I think even just moving back in at home for me full time was a huge transition. Um, I moved back in, and and it was COVID. So, you know, you, you, I've gone from sort of not living together all the time to then live in 24 seven, you know, with, so that transitions also it is quite a big one. Um, and then obviously trying to cope with not actually playing. Um, I still train as much as I possibly can because I actually love it. Um, that's part of my day to day routine. So I, I can hold on to that bit. Um, but the, the matches, the competitiveness, the, the, the day to day banter, the training, the everything about, match day as well is, is something that you hugely miss and that's something that, that I really miss but now I do like the the media and the punditry and the commentary and I'm an ambassador at West Ham so I can sort of try and get a little bit of something from that just to fill my cup up but it, is it, if you were to, to have that but if you don't have that and you don't have anything to go into I, I that transition is, is huge, it's a massive change in your whole life let alone just retiring from football so last question then Matt um, how would you like to be remembered in terms of your journey and your future plans um, yeah I, I'd like to be remembered as I think a lot of people say you know he's such a nice guy but I would much rather be you know I am I pride myself on that as well I you know that is that is the way I am and but yeah you know, I would like to be remembered as a, a really dedicated hard working footballer um uh for sure i think that's something that i've had to work out i was never you know just gifted i've had to work from start to, to finish to make sure that i was stayed on top always the best i could possibly be so yeah that that would be how i'd like to be remembered excellent i just want to say thank you for your time matt um there's some been some fantastic insights some great honesty um and your journey's been significant in the fact that you've been dedicated and worked very hard to, to get where you've got to in terms of your Premier League, England cap, um, and obviously playing in the Championship um, and lower leagues as well. So I just want to say thank you for your time and uh, good luck in the future. Yeah. Apologies, I've got cold as well. <laughs>